Today we talk about uh, methods for post-processing of F MCMC output. Um, and I would like to acknowledge my collaborators. So this is work that I did during my uh, postdoctoral research at King's College in the Biomedical Engineering Department. And in particular, I would like to acknowledge uh, Steve Niederer, Lester Mackey, and Chris Watts, who collaborated on this, on this project quite intensively. Um, right, so uh, the outline of my talk. So I will first introduce and motivate um, why we developed this method and what was the problem that we had and that we were trying to solve. Uh, I will then uh, tell you what we mean with optimal tuning of MCMC output and show you some results to conclude. Uh, again, it's, uh, it's a bit of a high level talk. I try to keep it high level, but uh, um, I'm really happy to discuss later if you have questions. All right, so introduction. Um, so I've been working in a, a computational cardiology department. I'm realizing now that there is no keyboard. Is this one working, actually? Maybe not, okay, yeah, it's fine. I have a nice video later, but it's not, it's all gonna work. It's fine. Um, all right, so computational cardiology. So what did we have? Um, we, um, the, the whole idea and the vision of the group that I was working in was to create digital twins of the human heart, which means uh, digital replicas of uh, person and personalized replicas of, of uh, uh, the human heart. Um, integrating different scales, so cell scale to tissue to the whole organ, uh, and different physiologies, so electrophysiology and mechanics. And so it's a very complicated problem, typically described by uh, sets of uh, differential equations, so ODEs or PDEs, that have parameters, and that's where the personalization comes into place. Right. Um, I was working at a cellular scale, and this, this is what this talk will be about, so fitting parameters for cells. Uh, where it's possible to run a forward solver in a fairly relatively, um, not, not, it's not expensive to run, to run a forward solver, so it takes of the order of seconds. Um, but it's hard to assess the quality of the samples that we have. And given that we, we, we anyone works with finite computing budget, right, be that time or funding that you have for a cloud computing, um, it's really important to try to make the most of those samples. And when I say make the most, I have in mind this idea of uncertainty propagation through scale. So if we want them to use these samples to evaluate expensive functions, um, that can be ma any map of those parameters, right, and expectations at different scales, then we want to select the best samples that we have uh, so, that, uh, so that they represent our uncertainty in a proper way. Um, and so this is, where, um, this is where this work is placed. Um, Right, so just a brief schematic of the cell model. Uh, there are many cell models in computation, in cardiology, and in general, there are many mathematical representations of the same phenomena, right? I was working with a specific one, which um, had a number of parameters, so 38 in this specific case. And so what happens is uh, we were modeling uh, calcium transients. There are many ions that go in and out of your cells. Calcium is the one that is eventually responsive for um, cell contraction. And so uh, this model, in this model, calcium comes in um, the cell through some proteins on the cell membrane, right? So these L-type channels, and then it stimulates calcium release from uh, this bag of calcium. It's called sarcoplasmatic reticulum. Calcium that goes into the cytoplasm, it, it binds to troponin, which is this contracting protein, and then it goes back out from the, from the cell and then back into this internal bag of calcium. And so one possible model to describe this by considering what, what are the different states in which the protein can be, so open, close, uh, inactive, um, and the different time scales at which thing happens is uh, this hinge model that we were looking at, uh, which has six set variables, um, but we were able to observe experimentally only one, and that's the free um, concentration of calcium in the cytoplasm. So it's that, um, I'm, I'm talking about this variable here. All right. Um, and we um, had real data, so someone performed experiments on a number of cells. Um, eventually, we end up with uh, 20, actually 18, because two were corrupted, um, time series. Uh, so the experimental protocol um, was stimulating the cells in a way to enhance as much as possible, given the biologist's knowledge system identifiability. So they were stimulating the cell using a patch clamp experiment um, in the first two parts of this protocol. So I'm looking at this uh, stimuli that were given to the cell. And then they were exposing the cell to caffeine, uh, which uh, makes the cell release all its calcium concentration. And so that was, again, meant to stimulate some of these proteins. 
And I am not sure how much you can see it from here. It's, I'm realizing the slide is quite pale, but this is the time series that we were working with. Um, I'll be focusing for most of the talk on one time series only, and then have some uh, remarking, um, remarking um, notes on the ensemble of this time series. But so let's uh, look just at uh, these black lines. So I said we were observing only calcium concentration, which is this first line here. Um, we were actually, and so the biologists were actually measuring also transmembrane current. So that's a deterministic, it's a variable that can be deterministically computed from the other six ones. And so it's not modeled explicitly in the OD, but we can just compute it um, in, uh, in our analysis. All right. Um, and so this is a simple model that uh, we set to, to start with um, from a statistical point of view. Right, so mathematical model, as I said, is this hinge model of uh, six ODs and 38 parameters. We assumed a non-initial um, initial condition, which means we were running the model long enough so that it was getting to steady state. Uh, and we said, well, the time series that we have, uh, we assume that those could be reasonably represented with add, uh, added uh, and additive gas and noise on top of these ODs. And the variability uh, that we were observing in those time series um, was modeled as coming from uh, different parameter values, right? So the, the whole uh, goal was to estimate these parameters for each cell. Okay, um, and uh, we decided to proceed with a Bayesian approach because uh, it allows us to naturally, in this context, incorporate um, uh, expert uh, knowledge. And so we, with our prior, we were able to, to impose this expert, expert elicited knowledge and also system unidentifiability. So white posteriors in this case, for example, are uh, indicative of uh, unidentifiability of some of the parameters in this original parameterization. Okay, and, and so the goal was, as was said earlier, to get samples from the posterior, uh, which is proportional to a likelihood form that captures um, information on the parameter that is uh, contained in the data, right, times the prior, so it's this pi of x here, um, which is our expert knowledge, divided by a normalizing term, which is an intractable integral. And uh, as I guess many of you are familiar with, a way to uh, avoid having to deal with this intractable um, integral is to use MCMC methods, which um, allow you to set up, if you set it up properly, a machinery to iteratively sample um, from a distribution that will eventually converge to your posterior of interest, right? So we will get uh, at convergence a correlated sample from, from, from our posterior P. However, MCMC is not a silver bullet and it actually suffers from, from a number of uh, problems and it can suffer from a number of problems, especially in high dimensional setting like this one. So again, we had a 38, so around 40 dimensional parameter space to explore. Okay, um, and in particular, so um, in, we had an idea or we, we, we think that in our setting parameters um, live in a manifold and some of them are coupled together. So this is a thresholded version of the Fisher information matrix evaluated in one point of the parameter space. So we do know that the Fisher information matrix talks about posterior variance, right, and it's parameter dependent. Um, and so by um, we, we can see correlated blocks of parameters, parameters here and actually by evaluating it in different parts of the parameter space these blocks will change uh, and we have an intuition of that because we were trying to Im implement some methods based on the Fisher information matrix which don't really work locally and so um, parameters are coupled together. Um, there are many MCNC schemes, right? Some of them um, can use uh, gradient uh, of the posterior, information of, uh, based on gradients of the posterior, which in theory should allow you to explore the, and learn the parameter space fa faster. Uh, but they also have some step sizes, which are hard to tune again in these real settings. Um, and moreover, they require you to compute the sensitivities of the system to compute the gradients, right? And that comes at a higher cost. Okay, and uh, moreover, the um, solver that we were using, right, has some numerical thresholds that um, typically you set before running the MCNC machinery, right? Uh, and the solver often fails if you take too large steps, for example, in the parameter space. 
And that was also hard to tackle and unclear how to tackle without introducing some bias. So in particular, we were rejecting the parameters that were making the solver fail. That was our approach. Okay. Um, and so what we decided to go with, given those considerations, was to uh, use a simple random walk MCMC, which is one of the simplest MCMC methods that you can think of in this high dimensional parameter space, right? So in the top part of this uh, slide, I'm showing uh, trace plots of, uh, so it's um, representations of marginal um, parameter posterior along the MCMC iteration. So here we have a long run of our MCMC methods for the first eight parameters. I'm not showing all of them, but you can have an idea of what was happening for the rest, right? Um, and this took a couple of weeks to, to run. What's happening here is that, so again, if you have played a bit with MCMC, you know that a good behaved, a well behaved MCMC looks a bit like a fat cater caterpillar, right? Which means your algorithm has explored and has learned the parameter space well. However, that's not the case with our trace plots. I'm looking, for example, at that one. But in general, um, we can't say that by looking at these trace plots, our MCMC has behaved well. But then if we look at the fits um, of, the, uh, of, uh, of the data, right, so by, by using some of these samples, we know that those samples do contain some information because, um, because the, the fit look very much like the data. I don't have in these slides a, um, a plot of, how, of what this would look like uh, if we were fitting the, the model using prior parameters, but it, it would be all over the place. And I'm happy to show you. Um, I have to show you that offline. Um, yeah, so this is not a posterior predictive, really. So it's the same data that we use, but we also have posterior predictive um, plots in which we were um, leaving out one third of the time series and then fitting the rest. So it's, it's a similar it's a similar scenario. Okay, and so we we wanted to make the most out of these samples by uh, selecting what what of the samples are most rep uh, mostly representative of our posterior. And so that led, led us to develop this concept of optimal thinning of MCMC output, right? So just to set the notation and the schematic, we have uh, an intractable distribution P, which here is represented on the left-hand side, uh, for which we can see like contour plots uh, supported on R to the D. So that's, that's actually a standing assumption that we have a continuous distribution in this work, but it's possible to generalize a similar, similar approach to discrete distributions or a mix if you want. Um, and then we have an MCMC that is targeting the distribution with some um, initial samples, right, that are, um, have been initialized somewhere at a delta mass somewhere far from the posterior, and then they are converging slowly, slowly but not really exploring the two modes in an equal way. So in particular here we have more samples concentrated in one of the modes, right? Okay, um, and um, so we know that uh, traditional MCMC post-processing uh, leads us to identify two parameters. We, one is a burning parameter, which discards this first part of the samples. And one is a thinning parameter T, which means that we, uh, we will retain every T parameter from our MCMC. That's the usual approach, right? And that leads you to approximate your posterior with an empirical distribution that looks very much like this. So it's discard the first B samples, retain every T parameter. Um, the main problem with this approach, and that's why we were working on it, is that um, it suffers uh, a bias variance trade-off if you have a fixed number of samples. So if you don't allow your, sample, your MCNC to run for longer and longer until you have an indication that this, type, that this object has converged to a distribution P. And typically the way that that convergence is um, considered is by running multiple chains, which also increases your computing time. Uh, and in particular, so the burn-in does tackle the, ba the bias, but it increases variance if um, this burn-in parameter is large, and then you have a very small number of samples left. And thinning, there are indications that also tends to increase variance, again, in this fixed length scenario. Okay, well, what we wanted, again, was a discrete, represent a discrete approximation of P, so an empirical measure, in which we're selecting um, uh, a number of uh, points from our MCMC output indexed by this um, pi i index, where uh, the number of points that we're retaining m is much smaller than the original length of the MCMC output n. So that, that's, how, that's our goal, and that's what we would like to do, right? So find a method that automatically discards these initial samples, and then it biases 
the samples that we're retaining in this uh, cartoon example equally from both modes. So this was a mixture of Gaussian, really. <laughs> okay, perfect. So uh, I will go quickly uh, just to give you an idea of what we did, and then again we can talk a bit a bit offline. Right. So. We decided to go on a, with an approach which consists in minimizing a discrepancy measure between uh, our desired object, so this empirical distribution and the target, setting the cardinality of the points that we're retaining. And we came up with a method that we call Stein Tinning. And I will give you a brief overview of why, why we called it that way. But uh, what this method does in practice is to specify what discrepancy measure we use between the empirical distribution and the target, and how we solve this minimization problem, because it's a combinatorial optimization problem, right? OK, and so very briefly, so choice of discrepancies. Um, there are many discrepancies between probability distribution that you can, can consider. Um, a very common one that people look at uh, is the so-called integral probability matrix, which means uh, you're considering what's the worst integration error against a class of test functions f um, between your empirical distribution and your target. And this approach suffers um, two problems. So we, first of all, assume that we're not in a, in a setting in which we can compute expectations against the posterior. And then it's uh, hard to solve, to find this worst element in, the, in our um, class of test functions f. And so a method to solve this, which is not our contribution, it, it was proposed in the literature before, was to combine um, two tools. So one that comes from the theory of reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces that allows you to get rid by using a kernel trick of this supremum. And one which uses Stein's identity, which allows you to find a class of test functions that has zero integral against the target. And if you do that, you come up with this um, Stein discrepancy or kernelized Stein discrepancy, uh, which in, a, in the case in which you're using um, an empirical distribution to approximate P really boils down to summing the elements of a matrix, uh, of a kernel matrix that requires a base kernel and gradient and score functions, basically. So gradients of your... Um, of your log target and choosing this kernel k which is one of the tools that uh, that you need in, a, in an appropriate way allows you to find um to, to guarantee consistency so so allows you to define that this empirical measure will eventually converge weakly to your target and yeah i don't know how much time i have but um oops the other thing that I wanted to say, but I, don't, I can't play the video here, is how we saw this optimization, which was done in a greedy way. So each time we were selecting um, the point that we were adding to our, MC, to our uh, retained set of samples in a greedy way by scanning the whole MCMC, keeping the point that was minimizing the KSD, so this kernel stand discrepancy, once added to the previous set of points. Uh, so that's, that's the method. Um, and yeah, you have a you have a link to YouTube video, so you can you can have a look at that. Um, I would like so I would like to conclude briefly. So we have um, a number of theorems in the in the related paper that uh, assure you that if you're running um, ergodic MCMC methods, the this post-processing procedure will allow you to converge um, to select points that converge weakly to your. Um, to your target distribution. Um, and the interesting thing here is that that allows also for uh, the MCMC to be targeting a different distribution than your, in that your in initial one. So it's a different um, target distribution. And in particular, we were looking at tempered version of the posterior, which are typically easier to solve because they look much more like the prior. And then we were post-processing those uh, samples using this MCMC thinning. Okay, and what I'm showing here in particular, so is in this column, um, our um, uh, prior is a black line, different MCMC stuck in different modes are these uh, kernel estimates. And what I'm showing here, so it's for different choices of some of the hyperparameters involved, but let's look just at this column. Uh, what uh, tempered, what stein-tinned versions of the posterior look like, so they're more consistent. Um, and we have an idea that they are also, they have been debiased because we were computing with a, with a comparative method called support point. Um, and by looking at the values of our uh, KSD against competitive methods run either on the tempered or non-tempered version of the posterior, we have lower lower KSD values. So that's, um, that's what I wanted to say for one cell. 
And then briefly, so we, we iterated this method for all the cells, right? And if you squeeze your eyes, what, I'm, what I want you to focus on here is uh, the, pale, the pale region. So those are the um, um, contractions of the posterior with respect to the prior, so ratios of st uh, standard deviations, right? Um, and that allows us to, 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 to understand what of the, which one of the parameters for which cells were identified. And finally, we use those to approximate, I'll just skip to this slide, to approximate um, parameter covariances. So we did try to, to, to run a hierarchical model. It's very ill-posed with such a high dimensional parameter space and our data set. But then we were able to identify um, blocks of parameters. And, um, and the finding that we have is that um, parameters on the cell membrane and parameters inside the cells this result suggests that those were correlated and there was this comp um, compensatory mechanism between those. So that's what we found. Um, and I don't remember if, this, if in this version, yeah, we don't have conclusions, but the conclusion is, um, so we, we did find, we, and we did, um, I did present a method that is used to post-process MCMC output. The nice thing is that it can de-bias um, existing or poorly working MCMC, but one of the caveats is that your MCMC cannot be completely rubbish, so it has to have explored at least once the high probability regions because then those points will be retained. And so that's, that's the summary of my talk, and yeah, thank you for your attention. Well, um, thank you for the talk. Do you have any questions? Hi, Marina. Thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering, I've read this um, this work, you know, by Chopin and Ducrot, who also work on thinning by uh, trying to preserve control variates. Um, how does it compare to this? Because you could also have control variates yes. in your case, right? Yes, yes. So we, yeah, we had uh, some exchanges with them, exactly. Um, it does compare in the sense that their control variates is, so they have a number of control variates that they choose. Um, these kernel methods and choosing this kernel can be seen as an infinite collection of control variates, right? And um, so we, um, we have been talking to them, right? If you have an idea of which control variants you want to choose based on which characteristic of your um, function you want to preserve, right? You could modify this kernel, kernel by, for example, adding those control variants to the kernel so as to preserve com um, weak convergence, but also to enforce control of certain moments that you specifically want. So that's one of one of the ideas that, uh, that we're actually looking into. Um, their method is faster because it requires less computation other than, than this kernel, but uh, um, that's, yeah. Do you recommend designing the kernel to guarantee basically whatever control variety you want to fix? Designing the kernel exactly to guarantee whatever control variety you want to fix, but also to control convergence. So the control variants by, by themselves don't all they can work poorly so yes so uh, and then you need to give you need to decide how much weight to give to each different component um again based on some right. some method so, yeah. so is there some mathematical way of taking a few control variants and then turning them into a universal kernel i mean universal in the sense of guaranteeing this weak convergence uh we were thinking about an additive additive uh kernels with all of them i'm not sure if you can just turn the control variants mm -hmm. into a universal kernel yeah Oh, thanks. But yeah, we can we can talk offline. Yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you for the great talk. Uh, I was just curious. So you mentioned that uh, you focus on on simple MCMC rather than maybe gradient or other adaptive uh, algorithms, and I was just curious. Um, for these high dimensional problems, the intuition is that MCMC doesn't, or the basic MCMC doesn't actually explore the parameter space very well. And, and you mentioned that the main motivation was because gradient methods, maybe like Hamiltonian, Monte Carlo, is just difficult to find the right uh, step size. But I'm wondering whether your post processing method might actually still work better with gradient methods like HMC because you would probably. Uh, discard uh, regions where you have these divergent trajectories anyway because they have so much. I'm guessing you do this based on the likelihood or posterior value or whatever. Um, do you yeah, have yeah. any? Did you so, ever? 
So, yeah. so yeah, we, we were starting, implement, we actually implemented not HNC, but MALA in this case. Um, we didn't post process, well, actually we did, but for a simpler toy example, um, in which we had like a ground through control of what the parameters, what the right parameters were. Uh, I would say if your MCMC is, if you have an idea that your MCMC works better, use a gradient based MCMC. There is nothing that prevents you from doing that. And actually for this version of uh, this algorithm, you need to compute gradients in any case. It's just that we were, um, if you're running a gradient based MCMC, you can use what you have computed on the fly, right? While what we were doing here was to set up parallel computation for the gradients and then to collect them and then use them for the post processing. Uh, but definitely, so if you have a, an idea that your MCMC is already able to discard like an initial part of the parameter space, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah um, we have a question online. Someone says, uh, I'm not sure if I missed this, but what did you conclude from the Fisher information matrix or how did you use it? Yeah, so uh, I will actually have someone looking at that. So the, um, the idea for the Fisher information matrix part um, and analysis was to use the what's called a likelihood informed subspace, which means um, looking at a spectral decomposition of um, the Fisher information matrix, but you need to average it. So you need to compute this thing or a version of this thing. So this is a threshold, it's a binary Fisher information matrix. In general, you have continuous values in it, right? So you need to average it on the parameter space, which means you need to have um, some samples from the posterior already. And so they have this iterative method in the likelihood informed subspace approach in which they run short MCMC, then they look at the Fisher information matrix. They uh, retain only um, param linear combinations of the parameters that correspond to the high eigenvalues pra in practice. And then they sample the rest of these linear combinations from the prior. So that's a way to ideally have approximate MCMC that um, has better mixing properties because it's sampling from the part of the parameter space that is informed by the data. So that's the idea of how to use it. I can give you a reference. It's an old paper from 2014, I think. So, yeah. Um, yeah. You probably have time for uh, two more questions, if there are any. So, as a sub-step in this, you're doing a greedy optimization of the distance, how well yes. do you think that works? So, um, again, I hope we useful to have a key, um, keyboard here. But uh, the grid optimization is guaranteed to converge. To converge. So, and the reason why we did grid optimization, I'll just go to that soon. And probably I don't have the slide here, actually. It's fine. Um, we, did, we did grid optimization because that was proved to work in um, other approaches, which are um, are aimed at quantization of probability measures. Uh, and then we were applying those to MCMC. So we have a guaranteed consistency. And then we were looking at non-greedy versions, which means uh, we were not selecting one point at the time, but we were selecting few points at the time. And we also looked at speeding that up by mini batching the, um, so not scanning the whole MCMC output, but taking batches and then scanning, scanning just those to look for points. And we have in another paper, so consistency results for these two steps as well. Um, it's a way of optimizing the KSD. There are other methods, yeah. Yeah, uh, hopefully that answers. Yeah. Well, um, thank you. Thank you, Marina, for the talk. Um, let's um, give another round of applause. Thank you.